So after I released the first piece about RNDC being fired by Sazerac Corporation, many people reached out to me and there have been some shocking new developments that completely changed my analysis of the situation. And if you want to hear about it, stick around. So when I released the first piece about RNDC and Sazerac splitting, we had an overwhelming response. At the time of this recording, there's over 175,000 people that have viewed that video in just a few days. And as a result, some industry individuals watched it and many of them gave me feedback. And some of the tidbits of information that they shared with me are really shocking and actually changed my analysis of the situation and have brought me to the conclusion that in retrospect, I may have painted RNDC in a worse light than is justified given the facts. So if you haven't seen the first episode on this subject, please stop this video, go watch. Will Pappy Van Winkle be back on shelves after Buffalo Trace fires distributor? It's BRT episode 186. Um, it should be the one that's just before this video if you're looking at the list by date order. Uh, also, I would like to thank all of my new patron supporters. Um, very, very helpful. If you are watching this and you like this content, you love the philosophy of the show, you want to get more involved, you want to go on Barrel Picks, you want access to Barrel Picks, you want in-person events, you want online events, you want discounts on merch. We got a lot of good benefits for our Patreon supporters. Head on over to patreon.com and join Bourbon Real Talk Plus today. We'd really appreciate it. Now it's time for our disclaimers. So all of this information came to me from people claiming to have inside information from the industry, either because they are in roles or have held roles in the past that gave them some insight. And I want you to understand that this is all my interpretation of the information that I've received. And it, it's not vetted information like a journalist would call and confirm with PR. Much of the information that's been shared with me in private is probably information that they wouldn't want out in the public. Um, and so I couldn't confirm it, um, but You'll see once we paint the full picture, all of this kind of comes together to make sense. Uh, another thing is you have to understand that many of the problems that you're frustrated with as a consumer regarding Buffalo Trace products are simply because the supply and demand curve is out of whack. We don't have enough inventory for the amount of demand that's out there. And whenever that happens in any market, it means that there's going to be frustration with consumers. And because we have a three tier system, it's easy to point fingers at any one of the tiers because all of the tiers are doing something that upsets consumers. And we're going to talk about that as we get into this. Now, one of the, the accusations that I leveled at RNDC is that some of the reps were using Sazerac products to promote other brands that are not owned by Sazerac. And I can say that a former RNDC manager reached out to me and said that that actually did happen in this territory. Uh, the person almost lost their job. It was a very big deal and wanted to point out that he didn't think that that could be a contributing factor in the separation between RNDC and Sazerac uh, simply because it was not RNDC policy. And when it happened and someone was caught, it was handled. Um, and so it probably wasn't a huge contributing factor, even though my video made it sound like it could be. Um, another uh, interesting tidbit of information is that Sazerac has been hiring a bunch of in-market brand reps. And when you go read the job description, it includes taking orders, replenishing shelves, building displays. And these are typically roles that would have been fulfilled by RNDC sales reps. And you got to ask yourself, why is this happening? You know, it's very expensive for a brand to have a sales rep in market. And um, especially if they're going to be duplicating the efforts that you're already paying for with the money that you're paying your wholesale tier. Um, several people have confirmed that retailers have been dealing direct with SAS reps rather than wholesale reps. Another interesting piece of information was that Sazerac has controlled the allocation distribution for at least the last two years. And this was news to me. So, you know, in the past, once RNDC got the, the uh, inventory, they could do with it what they wanted and they could potentially put pressure on stores. Um, to buy non-Sazerac products. They could put pressure on stores to buy Sazerac products. Um, but I'm being told now that Sazerac has developed a formula where they keep track of all of the sales of their non-allocated items, uh, things like Fireball and Wheatley Vodka, and, and they own countless uh, non-allocated brands. 
And they, they use that in an equation to calculate what percentage of their allocated items are going to go to each retail bar or restaurant location. And um, I'm told that it is a very formulaic uh, process, uh, which is going to become significant as we analyze what this change is going to do. Um, another interesting bit of information that was shared with me by multiple people was that before this change, Sazerac went to RNDC and offered for them to continue in their role as wholesaler. But to stay in the role, they needed to switch from charging a profit margin on the product that they bought and move over to a flat per bottle or a flat per case fee just for distribution and logistics. So let me give you a, paint a, a picture of what that looks like. So say a $60 bottle like Blends, right? Uh, on a $60 bottle, the producer would normally sell it for about $35.50 to the wholesaler. The wholesaler has a, say, 30% margin. Um, margin is different than markup. 30% um, markup is where you take the cost and multiply by 1.3. Margin is where you take the cost and you divide by 0.7 if you want a 30% margin. So that puts the wholesaler's cost to the retailer at $50.75. The retailer marks it up 30% margin and you purchase it for $60. So under that normal scenario, the um, wholesaler tier is making around $15.25 for every $60 retail bottle that they, that they pass through. What I'm told is that Sazerac offered RNDC a dollar to a dollar 25 per bottle. Could you imagine being a business that's set up, all of your cost structure is set up to make $15.25 per bottle, and you're being asked to take a dollar 25 per bottle? And so, you know, what does all of that mean? We're gonna talk about that in the conclusion section. So let's talk about what all this new information means in terms of our conclusion. So uh, first of all, a lot of this seems to have to do with Sazerac changing their business strategy. They're, they're, they're positioning themselves to retain more of the profit from the second tier um, by charging or, you know, allowing the wholesaler to charge a, a flat rate fee instead of a margin fee. And it looks like the reason that they are making this change is so that they can afford the second element of their business strategy, which is they want to own the local relationships by having those relationships managed by people that are on their staff. And it is expensive to hire local brand reps, but I'm guessing that Sazerac looked at the situation and said, if we're spending this much money on the second tier, we have the option to spend this much less money. If we took all of that cash and hired our own people, they'd be 100% focused on our brands instead of the many brands that the sales reps represent when they work for the wholesale tier. Um, and I, I believe that that was probably the largest contributing factor. They wanted more profit and they wanted more control. Uh, another thing is that Sazerac will probably continue to use its data on non-allocated sales to determine who's going to get the allocated items. Um, I'm told that, like I said, it's been going on for the last couple of years. Um, and that means that my original hope that some of this changing would cause a redirection of the inventory to go away from the high-priced on-premise and price gouge stores that have been getting the inventory lately is probably unfounded. Um, it, it's likely that this change isn't going to affect the distribution of the products because the equation is so formulaic and it's been in process for the last couple of years, uh, which is kind of shocking to me because I've always believed that if Sazerac had the ability to redirect inventory away from price gouge stores, they would. Uh, but now it looks like at least for the last couple of years, they have been giving it to them based on their other sales. Um, and RDC was never set up to handle just logistics. Right? And so um, making it seem like the, the separation was caused by RNDC's failure for Sazerac when ultimately, when Sazerac presented to them, hey, how about you just become a logistics company and just move inventory around for us? Sazerac wouldn't be able to do that. Their compensation plans, their internal policies, um, you know, all of the benefits that they offer their employees are set up. To, to work when they're doing the full job and they're getting full compensation. Uh, but most of the companies that they switch to 
are basically beer distributors that don't provide a lot of in-market support. They're basically just logistics. Um, and so, again, probably the larger motivation for the change. Um, now, I will say that every negative point that I made about R you know, RNDC, I still stand behind it. All of that stuff actually happened. Um, but the reason why I'm kind of printing correction, if you will, is because my first video made it seem like those problems were wider spread than they actually were. And it definitely made it sound like those problems were contributing factors for the separation. And now it looks like it just might have been the strategic business change. I do want to make sure that, you know, my last video, a lot of people said you blamed everything on the second tier, on the wholesale tier. I want to be clear that the problems that you as a consumer are experiencing are happening in all three tiers. Sazerac is using the scarcity of its allocated items to push its non-allocated brands. And it's putting pressure on stores that they can't handle. Um, RNDC did actually pressure retailers for their own benefit. And also, at the direction of Sazerac, that all happened. Um, but likely lost the Sazerac business due to the shift in business strategy. And, and it's probably not because they were failing in their role as distributor. And retailers have played games with this inventory. And that's where a, sort, a lot of the source of your frustration is. In overall summary, Unfortunately, it looks like this change by Sazerac, it's not going to affect the MSRP of the product, so prices aren't coming down. It's not going to affect the supply because, I mean, they've, they've invested to increase capacity, but those bottles aren't going to hit shelves for years. Um, it's not going to reapportion the allocations by state because some of you said your state doesn't get enough product. I don't think that this change is going to affect that. And since Sazerac has been controlling the distribution of their allocated items, and they have been selling a lot of product to price scout stores because of their formulaic equation. I don't think that's going to change either. So unfortunately, I left off the last video with a positive outlook that maybe things were going to get a little bit better for consumers. Uh, but after this new information, I'm, I'm guessing that there's not going to be a whole lot of changes for consumers coming as a result of this change. Um, so hopefully that clears up all of your questions. No one guy is the bad guy. Strategic business decisions going on about profit, you know, controlling their market, so on and so forth. If this is your first time watching the channel, I'd love to thank you for the view and let you know a little bit about our show philosophy. We are all about bringing people together around bourbon. And that's something that's important to me because I lost my brother to suicide in 2014. And in the aftermath of that tragedy, I was trying to find a way to create community and connections so that people didn't feel alone the way that my brother did when he made that decision. And in the process, I decided to start this podcast because I figure if I can get you connected to whiskey, the whiskey will do the rest of the job and get you connected to others. Um, but as I built the podcast and got more involved in the enthusiast community, I saw kind of a negative side that can happen in online social communities. And that is, you know, the people showing hate to strangers online people being hateful about what you want to drink or how you want to drink it and things like that. And there's a lot of that in the whiskey world. We call them whiskey trolls. And that experience made me realize I needed to start Bourbon Real Talk Community, which is a free Facebook-based forum, and we don't put up with any of those shenanigans in there. You can get in there, you can ask questions, no one's going to make fun of you. It's all love in there. Um, but two, it made me realize that those people can be hateful to you online. There's nothing that keeps me from loving you online. And that's why I end every show the same way, and that's this. If you woke up this morning and you're unsure whether or not anyone loved you, just know that I love you. And I'll see you next time on Bourbon Real Talk.